Okay, so as you guys know, COVID-19 has changed a lot of things in the past. Um, we were able to come up and visit you. Um, now we're going to do it remotely. Uh, we're going to have three of these sessions. Each session I'm going to focus on something, a few different general sessions, um, but this one is session one. So if you can't make this one or, or if you can't make the other ones, it's, I'm going to record the first general session as well. And bear with me because I don't have any other team members with me on this uh, on this Zoom call, so I'm going to have to manage everything on my own. So today's agenda basically is from eight to nine, just do a general session. I'm going to talk about some FY21 application updates, the risk assessment, um, fiscal alignment, and any questions that you have for me that are more general. Um, and then some resources that we have on the website. Um, and I will try to take those links and put them in the chat when I have a few seconds. Um, and then from nine to one, I have scheduled district TA sessions. So I have Baileyville, um, AOS 96, RSU 39, and RSU 50 today. Um, I did put out an email with the schedule for the 13th and the uh, 20th as well. And ah, I thought I had it here in front of me. I will let you know what the topic areas are going to be for the 13th when we get to the end of the general session. So before we get started, just like an educator, I have to do a pre-assessment and see what you guys already know. So if you could just take a few minutes, um, jot down your answers on a scratch sheet of paper. Um, the first question is, what is the due date for the FY19? And hold on to your answers because we'll go over them at the end of the general session. So hopefully by the end of this general session, you'll be able to answer these questions if you can't already. So one, what is the due date for the FY1920 performance report? Two, what is the, hold on, let me let some people in. Welcome to Amanda and uh, Pat. Uh, we're just taking a pre-assessment right now uh, to, know, to see what you already know about the, some changes to the FY21 application process. Um, and so you're just, we're doing a pre-assessment, so just take a uh, scratch piece of paper and uh, see if you know the answers. If you don't, don't worry, because my goal is by the end of the general session, you'll be able to answer these questions. So I think we were at question two. What is the reporting cycle for FY1920 performance report? Three, where can a district find its risk assessment rating? Four, name three changes to the FY21 ESCA application. Five, what is the difference between an expenditure and a reimbursement? And of course, you know, always have to have that bonus question. What is the difference between an obligation and an encumbrance? I'll give you a few more minutes to just to think about those answers and then we'll move on. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and you can also, because there's so few of you guys, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, just jump right in. You guys want to give me a thumbs up if you're ready to go. You can use our, our little emojis. Okay, Amanda's ready. <laughs> Mitch is ready. So my purpose in doing this was trying to figure out some um, rather than try to throw everything at you guys in one general session, I broke it up into pieces. Um, every year we try to look at the application process and the performance report and we try to figure out things that we need to review with our districts during our TA sessions. 
So I thought of some general topics and then I tried to break it up over the three sections. So, um, so again, this first one is really gonna be about um, looking at the changes to the FY21 application and some other things that have popped up along the way. Um, we've done, we started monitoring about 35 districts this year for this uh, during the 1920 school year, but because of no COVID-19, we had to put some of those on hold. But some of the things that we found out were like, oh, we should bring that up at some of our TA sessions. Um, the monitoring, I'm gonna hold off until the 13th, um, but this one, but just know that might be, that it will be one of the topic areas for the general session. So let's move to the next slide. So the FY 2021 application and the FY 19 performance report dates. So I think we presented the, um, the federal year at a glance um, chart. We presented that at one of our office hours that we, held, we hold every um, Wednesday. Uh, but I do want to put that back on there. Um, it is located on our website. Um, if you just click on the ESCA coordinators annual update tab, um, you should be able to get right to it. It's right at the top. It's the first thing on the accordion list. Um, and I will throw those links into the chat. Um, but many of you have probably already been on that website. So as soon as you start typing it in, um, it, your computer will remember that website. So here are some dates. Um, August 1st is the due date, which hasn't changed for the FY 2021 ESCA consolidated application. That's what it was last year, so that still is the same. Um, what has changed is the FY, for any of you who still have some FY 18, 19 monies, um, that, um, those, those monies have to be spent um, or actually reimbursed as well by September 30th, and those reports will be due on November 2nd. Some of you may have already spent all your 18, 19 money, so you don't need to worry about that, but some of you had some, as of December 31st, you had some um, leftover, you had, you had to ask for some extension carryover uh, projects, and so this is when that time frame. If you don't spend it by September 30th, or actually September 30th, you have to get reimbursement by October 15th, um, that money will get, sent back to the feds or it will be reallocated in some format. So keep that in mind, September 30th, um, and you have to invoice it by October 15th. Um, now I'll move forward to FY 1920. Um, this is where it's a little bit different. Um, we're so used to, in the past, you had to report in 12 month um, increments, but we went back and I know I, for some of you, this is old news, but I'm just repeating it. Um, because I've still gotten a lot of questions about the performance report. Um, so I just threw this back on there. In the past, you had to report from, um, from July 1st to uh, June 30th. We attended, a bunch of us attended a conference back in February where they really talked about the statute and we went back and we looked at it and we realized that we were really following statute. The statute says you have 15 months to, to spend those funds. So we went back. And so now the report period is from 7-1, but this is for FY1920 funds. Your, report, your spending period is from set, uh, July 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020, which is a 15 months. That's what the statute says. Your Title I carryover percentage report and private school reconciliation, reconciliation page will be embedded in the report. So in the past, you had to fill out your performance report um, I think it was like due July 15th, um, and it was from July 1st to June 30th. And then you had another report or two other reports that you had to complete um, by October 15th. One, if you had any Title I carryover funds that were over the 15%, then you had to fill out the Title I percentage carryover report. And then you also, if you have any private schools or non-public schools, then you had to also fill out the reconciliation page um, by October 15th. Those two reports are now gonna be embedded in your performance report. So you're only gonna have one report um, due and that will be um, November 2nd. Um, and, but keep that in mind that any, any funds that you have left over um, as of September 30th, 
your, your carryover projects will now run from 10 1 20 to 9 30 21. And we always caution saying before you go ahead and just assume you're going to get a carryover project make sure you get that report in by November 2nd so that you can have you can have a seamless uh, transition uh, with your carryover projects because technically you're not supposed to uh, to carry over funds until it's been approved so that's why we're really um, focusing on that any questions on that so that is a lot to remember uh, any questions if you want to unmute yourself ask me any specific questions or just get clarifying information on that please unmute yourself and Go ahead and ask me that question. Okay, I see no questions. So, FY 2021 application, major updates. We have done a lot of fiddling with things and trying to make things more clear and easier for you to complete. Um, but we also try to make it easier for us because if we can read your applications and we can expedite the approval process, that's better for you as well. Because sometimes we get caught up and it may take us a little while to get through it because we're trying to navigate and go excuse me, go through all the pages. So I think if any of you guys have um, participated in or have watched the um, application walkthrough, Dan Weeks um, has kind of um, run or kind of facilitated the two uh, running, uh, two walkthroughs of the application. Um, we all on the team have jumped in and helped and supported and answered questions and fielded chat questions. Um, but I just wanted to review that as well. Um, the project budget grid. In the past, you just selected one program or one program was selected for the budget. Um, now specific transfer funds will need to be determined. And I have a, a screenshot that I can show you of that. So in the past, you just said Title V is going to fund a project at the high school. Now we're, going to add, now we're going to ask you if you have any funds that you're transferring into Title V, for example, if you decide to transfer your Title IV funds into Title V, you're going to have, under that project, you're going to have straight Title V funds, and we're going to ask you to indicate any transfer funds into Title V. And I think Dan explained this in the walkthrough, but I will again. What we're finding is that we're kind of, we're spending a lot of time tracking down where the money is and where the funds are. So this is a way for us to expedite the process. And we also believe it'll help you try to figure out where you have your spending based on um, when you do your performance report. So like, did it come out of this fund? Did it come out of that transfer fund? But keep in mind that once you transferred, it is that, that, is that funds, um, it takes on all the characteristics of that fund. So Title IV transferred into Title V, it is considered to be Title V funds. But when you go back on the back end, which is where the accounting comes in, that, that Title V account needs to know where to pull um, from if it goes over the allotment. So that's why it's not so much on your end, it's more on the back end with the accountants because they have to be like, okay, great, you have Title V, but we need to be able to we need to be able to trace where to pull that where that additional Title V funds are coming from. And if you if it's still confusing for you, don't stress because I can still work with you individually um, on that piece. Um, two ranking and distribution. Again, we're always trying to make it a little bit easier for you and also help us expedite the approval process. Remember that if a school is at 35%, which is column six, it is still eligible even if no money is allocated to it. So oftentimes I have to um, tell a district that they need to go back and um, update their uh, ranking distribution because maybe they don't serve their high school, but their high school is at 36% poverty rate. So technically they are eligible, but you just may decide not to, um, to serve them with a Title I program. 
what GEMS is going to do, or the, our, our system is going to do, it's going to pre-populate based on the information that you enter into column two and three. So you won't, it'll automatically tell you if that school is eligible or not. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to um, put money in there or put or fund that or project at that school. It just tells us that they are eligible. But keep in mind that you still need to follow all the rank and distribution rules. Fortunately, for many of the Washington County and Aristic County schools, uh, your district population is under a thousand, so you don't have to follow any of the rank and distribution rules. I think we only have like two or three um, in region one and region three that um, fall into that category. Uh, I've said a lot. Any questions? Anything anybody needs clarification on those first two bullet points? Okay. Um, three, the summary of projects. Again, we're always trying to make it easier and help expedite the process. The, in the summary of projects page, we've added another chart and it's a smaller colored chart. It's blue, white, and yellow. And it will appear at the bottom of the larger chart if there are budget areas, if you've overspent or underspent funds. And I'm gonna show you a screenshot of that. Um, in this presentation. And the last um, major update is, and it's more of a, a condition of COVID-19, uh, when you look at your ESCA assurances, you have to assure that you're going to have 95%, um, one, that you're going to take the assessment and or administer the assessment, and that you're also going to have 95% participation rate. This is also if you have any um, if you have any students that are participating, that you get if you get selected for the NAEP assessment. So in the ESEA assurances page under Title I-A questions B and E, you're going to mark NA because we did not administer the assessments this year due to COVID-19. So you don't need to write yes, you don't need to write no because that doesn't make sense because you didn't administer it. So you're going to write, you're going to click NA on those um, two questions. Monique, what questions were that again? It may look a little different on your end, but it should be, it's under your ESCA assurances. It should be Title I A questions. I think it's question B. I just looked at it right before I jumped on this morning. It's the one that says that you have to agree to participate in the assessments um, for reading, for literacy, math, and English language proficiency. And you should have yes, no, and then there should be an NA. You're going to, you're going to uh, click the NA button for this year because of COVID-19. Um, and then if you go a little bit further down, I think it's, it is E, I checked again, but I, I did it quickly this morning because I woke up thinking, oh, I forgot to put that in the presentation. Um, and it, this question about the NAEP assessment, not every school gets selected every year. It's your fourth and eighth graders. Um, you have to agree to do that assessment, but because that assessment wasn't administered this year because of COVID-19, um, you would just write NA. Okay, thank you. And then again, of course, um, as you guys know, when you wake up at in the middle of the night thinking you forgot something, um, I. Dan had mentioned this last week in the uh, walkthrough through the application, and I wanted to go ahead and mention it to you guys as well, because I know there's changes over the summer and different people um, get, um, I used to call it voluntar voluntarily assigned to do certain responsibilities. Um, and I've had several districts reach out to me and say, well, I didn't get that notification, or how do I get that notification? So. If you go to your um, profile page or your setup page um, on your um, on the data entry side, um, and you are updating your information like who is the contact person, who's the superintendent, um, who are the different principals, and your if you have multiple schools, who are those principals? What's their contact information? Um, if you go to the ESCA contact person, um, and this of course is Pine RSU, so it's um, 
it's not a real person. But if you go down to the bottom, I highlighted it and it says email. Right now, it just has one person's email in there. If you, if I don't know if you can see where the cursor is, if you, at the end of that first email, if you put a semicolon, you can add as many people, as many contact emails in there as possible. So if you want all GEM notifications to go to three different people, then you could just type in there, um, like I see Bill, if Bill wants, his name and then he wants maybe an admin's name or he wants his business manager's um, email address. You could put multiple email addresses in there. You just have to separate them with the semicolon and then you just hit post and update. And then when we send out gem notifications, um, anyone that's in that email line will get those notifications. And again, if you want, I can walk some of you through that, but it's, it's, um, I thought it was something important that uh, Dan had mentioned last week and I said, oh yeah, it's great because a lot of people want their business managers to get access to this or maybe it's the superintendent wants to get access to the gyms. Usually the superintendent will get notification, but it might be, I know some, some districts have, um, they have multiple people doing different pieces of the application. So this way it allows more than one person to get those notifications. And this is what I was talking about with the screenshot of the summary. So you're used to seeing the top chart, um, but you're not used, you've never seen the one at the bottom. So the one at the bottom is going to only populate if you have any errors. So if you over, say you did your budget, but you forgot that you, you forgot $500 in Title V. Um, so you still have left you $500 left over in Title V that you did not budget. Um, this chart at the bottom is going to pop up and it's going to say where you under or over um, budgeted in a certain category. Once everything is zeroed out and everything is budgeted based on the, the budget that you allocated for it, that chart will disappear at the bottom. So it's another check for you to see um, if you've got it all budgeted out. And I know it's really hard to see in this, and I apologize. Um, but if you can look under Title I at the bottom of the chart there, um, you can see how, actually you can also see it in the larger chart too, that we're asking you to um, determine, so Title I, there was a Title II transfer into Title I, there was an alt use of Title II into type, as use as Title I, and there was Title IV transfer into Title I. So what we're asking you to do is um, to tell us not only how you're spending your Title I straight allocation, but how are you also spending your Title II transfer into Title I? How are you spending your alt use um, into Title I? And how are you spending your, using your Title IV transfer? Now, as we've said, and I know Dan has said multiple times, this is Pine RSU. We have thrown everything into this. This is the everything in the kitchen sink into this school. Your school is not gonna look this complicated because many of you don't have all of these funds, you don't have Title III, not all of you have Title V, so your chart is not gonna look this expansive, but this is supposed to be universal so we can use it with all districts in Maine. Um, so that's, that's something new um, this year. I tried to squeeze it into one um, slide, so that's why it's so tiny. So for the FY1920 uh, performance report, remember the due date is November 2nd, and it's going to be for your reporting period from 7119 to 93020. So a lot of this was also, many of you guys use um, carryover projects, or in the past, you've used it for summer accruals. We're hoping by doing this, not only are we going to be following statute very, uh, a little bit closer, but it's gonna allow for you not to have to do carryover projects for summer accruals. And hopefully that will lessen or eliminate some of the need for your carryover projects. Um, and it might make your budgeting and your business managers, well, some of them will be a little happier. Some of them uh, will have to adjust to the change. But for the most part, we've gotten really positive feedback about this. Um, and I think people are starting to embrace that it's actually gonna make life a little easier. Sorry, Mitch, I just saw your question here. Um, you can unmute yourself, Mitch, if you want. 
I won't take it personally, Monique. <laughs> just a quick question. Did, is it just to add somebody? Is it, there's no space? It's just a semicolon? Yeah, it should just be a semicolon. Okay, all right. All right, I'll give it a whirl then. Thank yeah, you. and if it doesn't work, I'm, I'm thinking I'm meeting with you at 10, so <laughs> we can work it out. You are, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, and then reimbursement alignment. Uh, project budget expenses need to include transfer funds used for project expenses. So, um, I know that's another reason why we've added some of the pieces with you when you uh, figure out what funds you're going to use to f for your projects, because we were finding that um, like a budget, man a business manager might just go in and start taking out of a certain title, but the ESCA coordinator is like, no, I wanted that to come out of title four, or I wanted that to come out of the title two transfer or the title four transfer. So we're hoping that by having the projects assigned with all the funds, the transfer funds and the regular straight allocation funds, that this will help um, alleviate some of that back and forth. Our goal as a team is to reduce the number of like pushbacks that we have to say, oh, we need to make you need to make this correction or we can't approve until this is um, until this is taken care of. So we're trying to eliminate. Our goal is that when you turn it in, we can approve it as quickly as possible. As you guys know, our turnaround is two weeks um, to review and give you back feed, give you feedback. Um, and our hope is that we can minimize the number of times that we have to go back and forth to get updates and changes. Um, we are going to create a webinar for the um, performance report for FY1920 because we are making some updates and changes to that as well. Um, and I sound like a broken record, but it's always to make it easier for you to complete, but also for us, um, easier for us to approve. Our ETA for opening up the 1920 performance report is August 1st. Uh, tell you right now, the team is working on that this week. We're hoping to be able to release that by August 1st. I mean, that is, I say that's our hope. I mean, that pretty much is our deadline. We, we're going to get it. We're going to have it open by August 1st. Doesn't mean that you have to have it done or completed because remember the due date is not until November 2nd, but we're also telling people that if, for example, you've spent all your money, go ahead and turn it in early. Um, and then it's one less thing you have to worry about. But for the others of you, it may not be till November 2nd, especially if you're using it for summer or curls. So the risk assessment. Um, I'll be honest with you, I probably didn't spend as much time on this last year with during my TA sessions, but I did want to go through with it with you on it. Um, we did do a risk assessment every year. It's required by Edgar which is the educational guidance. I can't remember exactly what all the letters stand for, but basically it's the guidance that dictates how funds are supposed to, federal funds are supposed to be used and allocated. So we have to do this every year in about June, and we have to assess districts and determine what their risk assessment is, what their risk, um, what their risk is, like what is their risk, um, and giving them federal funds. It's all, if you if you have nothing to do or you need to fall asleep at night, here are all the references to it. Um, CFR is the code that Edgar uses. Um, and again, I cannot remember what those uh, acronyms stand for, but I could find out if you give me a few seconds. Um, basically, we do an annual review of financial internal control and programming practices. Some of them are us, personally, the ESCA team has to go through. Some of them are the finance team uh, through the main department of education. And some of, our, some of them are programming practices. Um, if, you, if you receive any um, local entitlement money through IDEA, they have to do the same thing. And some of them are the, some of the, some of the pieces are the same. So if IDEA does it, some of the pieces that we, we both use the same pieces that are given to us. You have a number of findings. You can be low risk, moderate risk or high risk. Um, the grant notifications, which are issued for each title, 
um, and this is after your transfers, um, the risk level is issued um, to the district and you receive a grant notification for each title. Even though you receive a grant notification for each title, the risk, uh, the risk level is based on the district. So if you receive uh, a moderate risk, um, then it'll be moderate risk on every single title that uh, GAN that you receive. The risk rating is highlighted in yellow on the GAN, and I have a screenshot of what that would look like. Um, things to think about when um, you're for risk assessment. You really need to have timely submission and approval of your application. If your application is, um, is late or it takes a long time to get approved, that could impact your risk assessment. Your performance report and invoices. Um, if your performance report is not turned in on time and your invoices are not up to date, if, it's, um, if you have not invoiced for any of your current year's um, funds, for example, it's 19, I mean, we just finished um, FY20. If you have, if your district hasn't invoiced for any funds from FY20, that could affect your, um, your risk assessment. Accuracy and reimbursed expenses. If there's, when you turn in your performance report and the performance report doesn't align at all or has a lot of uh, misalignments with the um, federal reimbursement system, that can affect your risk assessment. And then any audit findings, every year uh, districts have to, by state law, they have to have audits. If any of those come back up, those also can impact your risk assessment. So you can think about all those things. Um, I know that for some districts, I don't notice it so much in Washington and Aroostook County, but I know in some of the other districts, some business managers think that they have to spend down uh, previous year's funds before they invoice for the current year funds. Technically, this is not how the money was allocated. It is supposed to be spent in the 15 months that it was that it was awarded in. So FY19, the intent of FY19 funds was that it would be spent in the 15 months from July 1st, 2019 to September, September 30, 2020. That was the intent of it. So if you're like, oh no, we're not going to spend any 1920 funds until we spend all of the 1819 funds, that can impact your risk assessment. So think about that as well. Try to spend, I know it's hard because sometimes you use carryover funds to fund this year funds, but it's just something to think about uh, for the future. So your grant award notification, I don't know if any of you have actually gone and looked at it, um, but on the um, data entry side, um, when you should be able to see all of your, uh, once, your um, once your once your once your application is approved, you should be able to see all of your grant award notifications for each of the titles that you have an allocation for, and also each of sometimes in the past you might have been approved for Title One, but you had your application was still open for Title II. Um, so the grant and award notification won't show up until all of your um, grant allocations have been, or applications have been approved. For those of you who are a little bit, have more, have been here a little bit longer, at one point, each of these titles had a separate application and you had to do it all separately. A few years ago, they combined them all together and they called it the consolidated application and that's why they're all together. When you click on one of those, if I clicked on the Title I, um, I think this is Title I, yes, if I click on the Title I grant award notification, on the right, this is what's gonna show up. Your risk assessment is gonna be down toward the bottom of that first chart, and it's gonna be highlighted in yellow. This school district is low risk. So what's gonna to happen to them is that they're just gonna have a random one random uh, request for documentation and one forced uh, request for documentation. Um, for those of you who don't necessarily do the invoicing, you may be like, ah, this, is, this doesn't apply to me, but you wanna to talk to your business manager about that because if you're a moderate or high risk, yeah, if you are, um, I'm jumping ahead here, I'll hold off to that thought because my next page talks about that. 
So again, you want to check this out once your application gets your applications get approved, go in and check your GAN and make sure just check out to see what kind of risk assessment you have. We did those risk assessments um, a couple of weeks ago. So we're hoping they should be um, on the GAN or you should be notified um, of your risk assessment um, quickly. The holiday kind of threw us off a little bit. And we've had, as you guys know, we've had um, people coming and going on vacations. Um, so there's, we've been, we haven't really been a full team um, probably since March. Okay, fiscal alignment. This is the kind of the last piece I'm gonna talk about in the general session. Invoicing. It is recommended that invoices occur on a monthly basis. Um, it helps maintain alignment between expenses and reimbursements. Um, I know some of you may only have a business manager that works once, one or two days a week, but what, what we're finding is that when you wait and you invoice three months at a time, or you don't invoice at all for like six months, it really, there's a lag and it takes a lot more effort to try to align expenses with reimbursements. Um, we recommend that you meet monthly with your bookkeeper or, or business manager to whoever does your invoicing. I know it's different for uh, dis different uh, districts um, that the ESCA coordinator meet monthly with the business manager to make sure that expenses are invoiced in an accurate and timely manner. I know I've had some ESCA coordinators that are like, I wanted it to come out of this fund, but the business manager took it out of this fund or whoever was invoicing. So we always recommend try to meet on a regular basis. So you're always, you're, what you've actually spent and what you're invoicing for align. Um, and then inaccurate accounting. Um, when you're, especially with your performance report, if you said that you've expended this amount of money, but the, the, the reimbursement system shows something different, that can hold up your approval. It can also negatively impact your risk assessment. And when you have a high or moderate risk assessment, um, it can result in more monitoring and documentation checks. So when you're low risk, um, it is required that when, you, when, you're in, when your business manager submits an invoice, they may be asked maybe once during that time to submit documentation. And they may have a one forced. Usually the first invoice, they require documentation for that year, for that fiscal year. If you are high risk, every time you put in an invoice, you're gonna be asked to submit documentation. A moderate risk, it may be more, it'll be definitely be more than once. Um, that may not seem like impactful for you because you're an ESCA coordinator, but your business manager or whoever does your invoicing is not going to want to have to do more work. Um, so just think about that. Um, we're going to be putting out some information. If you are high risk or moderate risk, we're also going to be providing more assistance, checking in with you, figuring out where you are in the process, um, trying probably doing monthly or quarterly check-ins with you to make sure that you're expenses align with your reimbursements. Now to the assessment. If you guys want to unmute yourself and answer the question, that would be awesome because I'm, I'm getting um, tired of hearing my own voice. Um, so what is the due date for the FY1920 performance report? Anyone? I'll take the easy question, November 1st. No? Uh, November 2nd. November 1st, I think, is a Sunday. So, uh, but if you want to turn it on Sunday, that's awesome for me. <laughs> um, yes, Mitch, you are correct. All right. Um, what is the reporting cycle for the FY1920 performance report? Come on, guys, it's not Monday, <laughs> it's Tuesday. <laughs> You could write it in the chat if you don't want to. You don't want to uh, unmute yourself. Unique. Yep. Fifteen months. Correct. Fifteen months. What's the start date? Um, September first to uh, to August thirty first. The start date is July 1st, 2019, and the end date is September 30th, 2021. So three, 
where can a district find its risk assessment rating? Gans website. Monique, Yay, thanks, thanks Amanda. <laughs> Um, so Amanda said, in the gym on the grant award notification, what color will it be in? Anyone? I just added that question in there. Yellow, yellow. Yellow, yellow. thanks, Mitch. <laughs> um, name three changes to the FY21 ESA application and if you just want to do one and then we can have someone else do another one so you, you don't want to do all three you don't have to and you can use the chat I know some people don't like to unmute themselves that error box of the money if you haven't spent it all or I don't know exactly how to explain it but I'm very excited about that error box because I always have errors. <laughs> yep. That's good. Yeah that's one of them. The Each help us budget grid. Okay. Yeah. Is that the same thing that she just said? No. No it's some it's some different. You were right Mitch and I know Pat Pat you were gonna say something. Each project has to be you have to list what what titles you're pulling the money from, from for each of your projects so that it's specific. Yep. Anybody have a third? Oops. Sorry, guys. I just lost it. Hold on. Give me a second. <laughs> uh. Is this helpful? Ranking and distribution, um, you won't, it's going to pre-populate some of your, it's going to pre-populate your eligibility based on what you enter into columns two and three. Okay, let me get back to the last question. Wow, it keeps doing that guy, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's why, okay. There you go. And what's the difference between an expenditure and a reimbursement? I can help you out guys here. So the reason why I threw that question on there is because oftentimes I work with ESCA coordinators and then they fill out their performance report and they say they've expended all this money. But when I go and look at their um, federal reimbursement system, I see a lot, the balance is way higher than what they say it is. And what I am finding is that the ESCA coordinator may have been keeping track of what expenses were, but the business manager may not have invoiced for those, um, for those expenses yet. So when you do the performance report, it's based on what you've been reimbursed for. What invoices have you received reimbursement for? That's what should be in the performance report. So that's why it's such a good idea to meet with your business manager and to have them invoice for expenses on a more regular basis because you know you as an ESCA coordinator may have, may have had this expense back in September, but if your business manager has an invoice for it and you're filling it out, or maybe you had the um, expense in September, but your business manager isn't invoicing until December, when you fill out the report in November, you're going to be like, hey, we already spent this money, but technically you didn't invoice for it. You haven't received reimbursement for it. So you, your, your balance is going to be different 
than what the reimbursement system uh, says. And so I often have this conversation with some ESCA coordinators saying, yes, you probably did expend that money, but you just haven't gotten reimbursement for it yet because your business manager or whoever does your invoicing hasn't invoiced for those expenses yet. Okay, so that's why I put that in there. Now I am not going to answer this question. I want someone to I want someone to try to tell me the difference between obligation and encumbrance. And the reason why I throw this out there because this was probably one of the biggest learning curves that I had when I started with the district with the state uh, with the Maine Department of Education. So I want to see if anyone on um, on this call can give give me a definite or give me the difference between an obligation and an encumbrance. And it's really important when you're talking about. Um, especially when you're talking about the Title I carryover percentage. And for any of you who have over that 15% carryover, some, this question does come up a lot. And Amanda, I see you have a question. You can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat, whichever you want. And I'm gonna let people think about what's the difference between an obligation and an encumbrance. Yeah, so my question is, is there something in writing um, that we could give our business managers to let them know about this uh, monthly expectation? I, I would much prefer to do it monthly, but they're just so busy um, that it's hard for them to do that. But I feel like maybe if something would come from you guys, it might make it easier to convince them to do it monthly. Yeah, and I know, and it's it's um, it's kind of a recommendation because um, we don't want to say you know it's not necessarily a requirement. Um, we our requirement it has to be in three month increments, but some districts will wait and they'll they'll do three months, but they'll wait like six months or they'll wait ten months and then they'll just do they'll do a three month and then once that one gets approved they'll do another three months. So some districts are like eight seven, eight months behind. Um, but I, we can definitely, I can take it back to the team because I know it's not just, a, um, you know, not just a, a concern that I have, but I know that all of us uh, have talked about it. I know that's one of the pieces that are on the risk assessment. Um, we do find that the districts that do more of a monthly invoicing, um, do more monthly invoicing, they tend not to have as many discrepancies between um, what their expenses are and what their actual um, balances are after reimbursement. But I can definitely take that back to the team and see how we can word it to the field and to the business managers so that, um, you know, we can show them that it really is, it really does make your life easier in the end. Um, because I know maybe not so much with you guys, but I know I've had some districts that I go back and forth and back and forth going, I'm so sorry guys, but you're, and usually we give a little bit of a um, of a leeway, like we you don't we say reasonably aligned, so we're not expecting it to be exact, but it can't be more than, you know, if it's off more than a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, and we're like, eh, we need to go back and and work on this to make sure we we make that gap a little less um, difference. But definitely, I'll take it back to the team and see what we can do to put out to uh, business managers to strongly encourage them to uh, do the monthly invoicing. Um, or even if they don't want to invoice monthly, at least you know, set up some time to talk to them about, you know, like I said, I've had several ESA coordinators going, but Monique, I, you know, I didn't want the business manager to pull it out of that account. I wanted them to pull it out of this account. And I'm like, oh, I can't really do anything about that point at that point, but it just encourage you to have that conversation with them. Um, is, no one, is anyone going to tackle the obligation and the encumbrance? Are you going to make me do it? <laughs> wow, I feel like I'm back in, in the classroom again. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and answer that question. And the reason why I bring it up is because it really becomes more of an issue with um, Title I percentage carryover reports. So what I like to say, an obligation is kind of like a purchase order. So you, you've already put in a purchase order. You have decided that you're going to purchase so many supplies. Um, and even though you haven't gotten the bill yet for those supplies, you've already made an obligation to pay for those supplies by issuing a purchase order. Or you have... Um, put it on the credit, you may have a district credit card and you've put those supplies on that district credit card. And you may not have paid out 
that um, a bill, but it's an obligation that you have to pay. So just like you have to pay your credit card bill, you have to pay out on those purchase orders, that's considered an obligation. Another form of obligation is, which usually comes into play with the Title I percentage carryover reports. So in the past, the Title I carryover percentage report was due on October 15th, and it was for any expenses, reimbursed expenses up to 9.30, September 30th. So what happened was that some districts, based on their payroll, they may not pay out until October or even say October 15th. So if the pay period ends like sometime in September, but you don't pay out until October, that's an obligation because your staff, those people worked in September. So they worked before September 30th, but they may not have been paid out until after September 30th, they may have gotten paid on October 7th or October 10th, depending on how your payroll system works. So the obligation is for that time and that those that money that was paid, that's going to be paid for work that was before that September 30th um, deadline. It might also be a contract, for example, if you said that you're going to pay somebody monthly for their work in September, but you don't actually issue the money until, or that you don't actually issue the reimbursement until October. They already worked their time in September, but they're not getting paid until October. That is an obligation. It's stuff that you've already worked for, already obligated funds for, like a purchase order. You, you have, you've already got that money, you have to pay it back, They've, but you just haven't reimbursed them or haven't paid them for that, for that work or that, um, the supplies. An encumbrance is more like teacher salaries. And teacher salaries are not obligations because teachers haven't worked that time. You just put that money away, you encumber it so that you don't spend it. So for example, you a lot of districts will encumber. We do it at the, we do it in our team. Once we give you guys the allocations, we go to our accountants and we say encumber all of this money for Machias. Machias has an allocation, I'm just making this up, like $40,000 for Title II. Go ahead and we tell our accountant encumbered $40,000 for Title II. That tells us we do not spend that money because we know we've, we've encumbered it for, for um, Washington County. It's different than an obligation because that nobody has worked. They haven't, it's not like, well, why can't we encumber, why can't we obligate teacher salaries? According to the federal government guidelines, Edgar, you can only pay for work that's been completed. If you can't, you can't obligate a teacher salary for March and it's September because they haven't worked. They've only worked in September. Um, you can only obligate for funds that they've, that they've already worked. Um, but you can encumber, so you can say, hey, we're going to encumber all of our teacher salaries for 10 months, so we know we've got this pot of money, we know we're not going to spend it, we've encumbered it, we know it's saved for a special purpose, um, and we're not going to spend it on anything else. So that's the difference, because I have teachers, I've had districts who are like, oh, well, I, I'm going, our salaries are obligated, so therefore I'm going to be under the 15%, and I'm like, no, you can only obligate funds that have already been basically spent or time that's been worked, you just haven't reimbursed them for that time or paid off your credit bill or, or paid the purchase order. I know that was kind of complicated, so if you want me to clarify that again, please let me know. And I know I have like five minutes, so I apologize. Um, but I just want to get that worked out for some people. And I'm just going to advance to the next slide just so you guys can see the resources. Um, here are a bunch of resources um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, when I send this recording out to you guys, I'll put these resources in as links so that you can get them. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the, um, the uh, main department of education actually has a webinar library and there's a section on there with all the ESCA program um, webinars that we've done and all the different uh, recordings that we've done. They're all on there, but then on the bigger list, if you ever want to just go watch some of the other webinars that the um, 
the, the DOE has put out, they're all on this website, um, YouTube. And if you um, join, um, you'll see it's a little bit easier too. And then lastly, and I apologize, um, this went longer than I thought, but here's the agenda for today, uh, for the rest of today. Um, the TA session for um, the second TA session, which will be the general session on July 13th. I'm gonna talk about monitoring and some compliance. Um, and if there aren't any more, oh, there was a question in the chat. Jane asked, will this slide, these slides be available? Yes. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, I'll send a recording to you guys uh, once it comes available. And then I'll also send the slide deck to you as well. And then I'll take those links, the resource links, and I'll send them to you all in that same email. So the email I'll send to you will be the, the recording, the slide deck, and then the, um, those links as separate links. And I'm gonna stop recording. I can. Thank <laughs> you.